It's good to see everybody's face. I know a lot of people are taking advantage of uh, summer and actually taking vacation right now. Um, since we've not been able to do that, I know several families out doing that this week. Um, but so glad that those of you who have joined us are here today. Uh, great to see all of you. And of course, those that are still joining us online as well, uh, for those that either have to or just want to uh, because of distance. Uh, we just are so thankful that uh, you're joining us still that way as well. So if you will go ahead and stand, we'll start this morning with worship and enter in to God's presence today. It's why we've come to meet with him. So let's go ahead and welcome him in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. God, just the day to worship, to glorify, to magnify who you are. God, to declare the goodness of you. Lord, through our praise, Lord, through our singing, through our worship this morning, God, we pray that your name would be exalted. God, in the place, the position that you alone are worthy, God, we would place you in that place today. Lord, in our hearts, let us look to you. Let us put you, Lord, first in our lives. Put you on the throne of our hearts today, God. God, in anything that, that is there in our lives that uh, needs to be removed, Lord, show us those places that you want. Show us those places, God, that we need to surrender to you, Lord, so that you can have an even greater um, move, a greater measure of your presence in our lives. Lord, that we would be able to be empowered by your Spirit to take the gospel of the, the good news of Jesus Christ to this world. Again, Lord, we thank you for today. We bless and honor you here in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus.
reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God, beyond the skies above, the reaching out for us, the everlasting one, oh Jesus our God, oh we look to the sun. Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever, ever look to the sun, set our eyes on a Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever, oh we look to the sun. Give Jesus praise this morning. Hallelujah. I was buried beneath my shame. I could carry that kind of weight. Till I met you Oh, I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you Called my name
glorious day. Yes, thank you, Jesus, for calling us into your glorious day, calling us out of darkness into light, into life in you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you're the one who's above, above it all. The one who has all power, the one who has all authority today. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of the light.
over the universe, over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. The roll of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. of the Savior, with the heart of the Father, you're all we need. You're here with the hands of the healer, all your spirit, you're all
above every name. Just call on his name today. Call on his name. Yes. Worship the name. Worship the name. Father, we praise your holy name this morning. Our world is in chaos, but you're not. You are stable. You're always the same. Your love for us is always the same. And we magnify you this morning. We worship you, Jesus. Father, you are the calm in the midst of our storm. Oh, God, we love you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. And I've been looking here and... Um, can't find either one of the people. I'm, oh, there's, is that Abby right there? Yeah, okay. It's too dark here for me to see. And Jacqueline, are you in the place too? Oh, you're right front row. Okay. Turn those lights on. I can't see anybody who's sitting out there. I got I to gotta know who's, who the uh, people are that are watching. But uh, we, w we are here today to award a couple college scholarships to Abby and to Jacqueline. And you guys, would you guys just come forward here and stand here? One, two. Mel and face the crowd there. Mel and Luella Beckel have uh, have established a scholarship fund called the Beckel Scholarship Fund here at Northridge for graduating seniors going off to college. And uh, this year we had two applications. Both of these young ladies were awarded the full scholarship of one thousand dollars. And. Um, but I just say that it's, uh, I, I thank Luella and Mel for the heart that they have for young people and the heart that they have to bless them in their, in their sending them off to college. Now, would you guys like to come and present these to them? I know Mel is a little on the cripple side here. Yeah, exactly. Okay, here. And you know we're going to do this a little differently we normally do just hand those certificates to them and then i'm going to pray for the girls up here and uh abby is going to southwestern university in waxahachie texas yes and Jax is going to creighton university in uh, the omaha area so uh we're just thankful for that and let's just pray that god's hand would be upon both of these young ladies father we're thankful that we have two sharp young ladies that have graduated high school and are making those next steps in their lives to, to follow your will. And Father, I pray for, for Abby and for Jax, Lord, as they, as they launch out in a few weeks and head off to these colleges. Father, I pray that you would give them favor. I pray protection upon them. And Father, I pray that you would financially bless them in your name. And God, we love them both, and we just send them off, graduating them from Northridge, and we thank you for that. And everybody said amen, amen, amen. Thank you, girls, ladies.
let's see, this is uh, kind of, you're probably not leaving for a while to go to Texas, are you? No? Okay. Pardon me? Mid-August, Mid okay. All right. So uh, that is that is so exciting. Let me also uh, give an announcement or two. Uh, remember a couple weeks ago we were going to have this uh, truck of all the produce that we were going to hand out, and uh, the truck driver, <laughs> he, uh, uh, he delivered it to the Salvation Army. God bless them. And, uh, but it didn't come here, and it was really a, a nasty day to tell people, hey, we have no produce for you. You need to go home. But uh, I've been in conversation several times with uh, Convoy of Hope, and uh, this time they are coming back, only they're, they're really coming here this time. Last time they had delegated the delivery to a trucking company. This time, Convoy of Hope truck, the beautiful truck, is coming. We have a Convoy of Hope driver and they have they they felt really bad about it and uh and i had to get over it which you know you kind of got to get over something like that when you have such a, a a big thing and it doesn't happen and uh and so anyway they are they're wanting to do it again and uh this time they're sending their truck their driver and uh, it's in uh, it's a, like mid to late it's more late august is the date that we uh we had settled on and so uh, it's going to be an exciting thing. And they said they would like to leave their truck there the whole time that we're distributing food so they can have some, uh, you know, promo to all the people. And so I said, well, you better not, you know, we'll tell them that it's a different truck. You know, you guys didn't have that truck here last time or they might take some of the tomatoes and, you know, do something to you. But just know they are coming back. We do want to bless our community. With, uh, with those food. Last time, I think there was 760 cases of, uh, of uh, fresh produce. I know they're picking it up in Kansas City, driving it up, and uh, they'll be unloading it at 10 in the morning on that particular, it says it's again on a Tuesday. So that seemed to work well for some of my volunteers. Secondly, last week we had Jay Reisner here, and uh, he just did a marvelous job, and so many of you have commented, oh man, I really like that guy, he did a, such a great job. And uh, that was Sunday, and then on Monday we had a board meeting, and uh, the board and I decided that you know what we're going to really try to jump behind Jay, and we have uh, made a commitment that we're going to give to him a hundred dollars a month. That's twice what we normally give missionaries, but we don't have any missionary that reaches a hundred million people a week with that television program that he has. So anyway, just understand, as you give to the missions program here at Northridge. A lot of that money is going to be going to Jay. Not a lot, but I mean, a percentage of it is going to be going to Jay. Some of you have already came to me this morning and said, hey, I've got, I've got a special offering for Jay. Yeah, just put that in the offering, right? Northridge on your check and Jay, Jay or Jay Reisner on, your, on, on the envelope or on the check somewhere, and we will get it to him, okay? And uh, so we just want to bless him. I know there's been probably $1,500 just last week that came in for, for him. So that's just a tremendous, tremendous blessing. But... Jay is a special individual, as you can tell, uh, fun guy, funny guy, and very, very professional. And uh, where is, uh, 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 who was up here last week? Uh, Malachi. Where's Malachi? Hey, Malachi, you did a great job. I just want to tell you, man. Great job. You, uh, you stole the show. You stole the show, okay? All right, let's pray. And as you can tell, I don't have my headset. Something's gone wrong with it, so I've got a handheld today. But let's just pray that God's presence would be here. Father, I thank you for this opportunity we have to seek you and to look at your word. And Father, I just pray that you would be with us today. And God, that you would speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. I kind of forgot to say, hey, look, thank you for, uh, for those of you that are tithing, giving it in our buckets, sending it in the mail as we continue to, to work through this pandemic. Um, and uh Thank you, thank you. It's just a, it's neat to see a church that still is behind God and what God wants to do, even though we have some difficult circumstances that we have to operate through and, and in. So I just say thank you. And uh, continue to do that. Put them in the buckets when you come. Mail them to me, uh, to us at the church, or drop them off at my house. Anything you want to do, we'll be sure to uh, put it in the right spot. All right, here we go. Today I want to talk about Elijah. And I want to continue my series on prayers of the Bible. And I want to look at some of the prayers that Elijah prayed. And Elijah is a pretty amazing guy. 
And I want us to look, first of all, at some of the background scriptures. And then the real main text I want to get to is 1 Kings chapter 18. <clears throat> and, but you need to kind of see <clears throat> what Elijah had gone through and what his, what his uh, uh, background things were happening before he went, on to, went up to uh, Mount Carmel. And in first, and it's in there, you got the notes there in front of you. First Kings 16, starting at 29, it says, In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Amri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Amri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Wouldn't that be wonderful that they wrote something like that about you in the Bible? Did evil in the eyes of the Lord more than any of those before him. This was a bad dude. Verse 20, 31 says, he also married this lady named Jezebel, and he, began, and he began to serve Baal and worship him, which is a false god. Verse 33, Ahab also made a shear poles and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. Now, in those few verses, do you get the idea that Ahab, King Ahab, was a bad guy that did bad things? This is the guy that Elijah takes on, basically head on later, later, later on. Do you see the kind of character that King Ahab was? The worst of the worst. He was married to Jezebel as well, and between them, they were quite a team. <laughs> In chapter 17, Elijah goes, Elijah goes before King Ahab and prophesies that it would not rain in Israel for several years, and it would not rain until Elijah said it would. That's a pretty brash statement to make to a king who's been doing bad things for years and years. You see, Israel had turned to worshiping Baal instead of Jehovah, and supposedly Baal was a God who sent the rain. So God gave uh, Elijah a prophetic word and said hey look I'm going to stop the rain so that they can't think that Baal is bringing all this rain and we're going to stop the rain here for a while well with that in mind God tells uh, Elijah to go talk to King Ahab and uh, Elijah goes to the king and he basically says you've defiled the Lord and turned to this rain God and so the true God is going to make your rain go away and not come Elijah spoke with great authority, great confidence. No one knows before, no one goes before a king and tells them something unless they're absolutely sure that it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. But Elijah had that kind of confidence in God. And that's what I want you to zero in on and see as I go through, as I, as I lead up and as I unpack some of the things in Elijah's life. He had confidence that God was going to take care of things and he saw miracle after miracle after miracle. In his life James chapter 5 talks about Elijah it says Elijah was a man just like us he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years again he prayed and the crop and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops so can you imagine no rain for three and a half years now I want you to hear what the Bible says there about Elijah he was a man like us he didn't have something special like the rest of us don't have access to, but he was an ordinary man, man who was a servant of God. Now, Elijah was a man who understood prayer. There was not something inherently special about him. He was just a human like the rest of us. So if we, individu so if we individuals and as a church want to experience the kind of power that Elijah had, these are some principles that we're going to look at today that we need to see from the life of Elijah. Now, to have what Elijah had, we need to be able to take a stand no matter how unpopular that stand is. Can you imagine how unpopular the stand was for Elijah to go into this king and say, look, dude, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. It's going to be a long period of time. <laughs> It's kind of a death sentence. We need to stand for Jesus in our world because our world hates anything right now that is ungodly or that is godly. Our, our culture is so ungodly, it hates anything that is godly. We need to wage an all-out war on the kingdom of darkness. Now, when you look at the American culture right now, you would think that the kingdom of darkness is winning. 
I'm amazed when I keep looking at the news from time to time, and I try to stay away from it, but when I see different things, and I'm thinking, holy moly, we are in a, a time period that we never thought would be this, this bad. If the church is ever going to make a difference in the world, it's, going to be through our, it's not going to be through our programs. It's not going to be through our missions, budgets, or listening to the best preachers. It's because we get a hold of God in prayer, and God moves. It'll be nothing less than us as a body walking daily in the power of God and treading in waters that we cannot survive on our own. Elijah goes to King Ahab, and, and you know what he was saying, it wasn't his own power, but it was God speaking through him. The power of Elijah experienced through prayer was for a purpose. Now, if Elijah didn't go to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel to make claims about the Lord being God, he never would have stopped the rain. What good would it have done? But he needed to tell them why the rain was going to stop because they weren't serving the right God. Then God leads Elijah to go to a certain location east of the Jordan where he's there and he's, he's uh, being fed daily bread and meat by ravens. I had a gross description of what ra ravens do and how they, you know, they eat and then they regurgitate it to their babies. And who knows if that's how Elijah was eating or not, but it doesn't sound like a pleasant buffet to me. You guys picked up on that without me really going into detail, didn't you? So then later on, so anyway, he's being fed by these ravens. He's being kept alive by these ravens, which is a miracle in itself. Then he, a little bit later, he goes and he stays in the upper room of this widow's house. And he gets there by saying, he, he sees this widow and, and, uh, and, and he says, you know, can you make us some food? And she says, I just have enough for my son and I to make, you know, flour and, and oil, make one more meal and then we're going to die. Because the famine and the, uh, the uh, you know, the drought was so bad, they couldn't get a lot of that stuff. And she's like, it's over for me. I'm going to make one more meal and die. And he says, well, you know what? You make a meal and give some of it to me, and you're not going to die. So he goes and he lives in this upper room of this widow's house. What happens every day? The oil doesn't run out. The flour doesn't run out. And, and, and God continues to supply the needs for what they needed for that day out of, the, out of the resources they had. Another miracle that Elijah sees. He's living there, and then all of a sudden the widow's son dies. He takes her son up to the room, lays on him three times, and prays, O oh Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord hears his prayers, and the boy's life is returned to him. Another miracle that Elijah sees and is a part of. He stays there long enough with the widow until the word of the Lord came to him and said, Okay, the drought has accomplished what it was appointed to do by God. So it's basically now it's the time to go back to King Ahab and announce that the drought was going to be over. <laughs> now, King Ahab had been looking for him anyway. He couldn't find him anywhere. But for Elijah to obey that word from God shows us his strength and the faith that he really did have. <clears throat> He's going to go back to basically the enemy and tell him, okay, God's done with the drought. It's going to end here shortly. Now, he knew that King Ahab knew him and had a very unfavorable opinion of him. The king saw Elijah, a prophet, who fearlessly opposed all the idolatrous tendencies which the king had led the people into, and Elijah was against those tendencies. Ahab had great hatred for Elijah. Now, during this drought, the king had done all he could, but he still had, couldn't control things in his, in his world, in his kingdom. Most of the cattle had died. There was no grass left on the plains at all. And even though he still thought it was best to not trust in, in the, the true God, but he was trying to trust in himself and get through the thing by trusting in himself, and it wasn't working. Then King Ahab's wife, Jezebel, Attempts to exterminate what she was doing. She was exterminating Yahweh's prophets in their schools and in their communities. She was a piece of work herself. The two of them were a matched pair. 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 16, says, So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. 
when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you trouble of Israel? <laughs> he knew who Elijah was. I have not made trouble for you or for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family here, you have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the balls. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring, bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So basically, he has seen miracle after miracle after miracle in his life, and now as God has given him the, the uh, foreknowledge that, you know what, we're gonna, there's a showdown to come in here. It's the okay corral, so to speak, on top of Mount Carmel. Now, can you see the boldness and the tenacity of Elijah? He was afraid of no one. Elijah had an incredible belief that God was going to do a miracle. And he did not need a normal run-of-the-mill uh, run miracle. He needed a big miracle. And most importantly, he expected God to come through and give him that miracle. That's the neat thing about this whole story. He had no doubt that God was going to give him an incredible miracle. Now, remember, that was when Elijah had requested this showdown to set up to see who was the real God of Israel, who, who was the true God of Israel. The Lord had caused it not to rain for three and a half years. The Lord provided him with food through a raven, provided food and a place to live through a widow, raised that widow's son from the dead. What else? I mean, he is ready to go. He's got that in his history. Elijah had seen many miracles. Kind of reminds me of, uh, oh, David and the slingshot and Goliath. You know, David didn't go out there and just kill Goliath. One day. You know what? I think I'm going to go kill that, that big old giant guy. No, what does he say to the king trying to get permission to do it? Hey, I killed a lion. I killed a bear by your hands. No big deal. I'm going to go kill the giant. I've done these other things. And you see, sometimes God gives us opportunities to see other miracles that God does through us. So when a bigger miracle comes, we have faith to believe that God's going to come through. But now comes the challenge to see whose God has the power to send fire down from heaven. I thought maybe the fire just fell back here for a minute. <laughs> Kayla got knocked by the power of God back there on that chair. But without an incredible miracle, Elijah would have been killed. And God's chosen people would probably then drift into oblivion. It would be the end of God's chosen people. And at this time, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel had steered the nation of Israel down a road leading away from the Lord. And they had not only steered it away, but they'd put the pedal to the metal. They were doing all they could to get away from the true God. Now, in order to shock the nation back into, uh, you know, into reality, away from this path, the Lord sent that drought. Hmm. Now, into this mess, God sent a prophet, Elijah. He was wild, <laughs> and he was bold, but he was a messenger of God. Elijah was so bold, he risked his own life and set up for King Ahab a challenge, a duel. Well, when you show down, when, when the showdown takes place, Elijah stands alone on Mount Carmel, and he's facing all of these other prophets. It's him versus everybody else. You ever feel like it's you versus the world? It's okay if God's on your side and, and, and God's not on their side. No matter how many the other teams got. Elijah confronted the people of Israel with a challenge that we see in 1 Kings 18. And he says, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Look at the people's response. It's pretty telltale what was going on in that country. Look at their response. But the people said nothing. The people said nothing. They had become so pathetically lulled into total apathy, they couldn't even respond to what he was saying. Elijah confronted them with this challenge and told them to quit sitting on the fence. He told them that the Lord is the real God, follow him. And if Baal is the real Lord, follow him. Then Elijah tells them that what they're going to do is have a duel between the two deities. And his plan is that they both will offer an ox on the altar and the false prophets will pray around their God and Elijah will pray to his God and see which God sends fire upon the altar. <clears throat> and the winner is the one who sends the fire. 
uh, since Bell was supposedly able to control lightning, thunder, and rain, and, and everybody agreed, hey, it's kind of a mismatch. Our God, that's, a, that's, a, you know, that's his, his thing. He does that. One thing for sure, the event would be highly entertaining, wouldn't it? Don't you wish ESPN carried it that day? I'd even watch the reruns on that, baby. The Baal prophets went first. They prayed all morning. They kept praying for him to answer, but no answer came. From morning until noon, many of them were wildly waving their arms, and the others were uh, with their foreheads in the dust, raising chants to a God that did not exist and does not exist. No consuming fire, no lightning fell, not even a spark came to land on that altar. They tried more more exciting things. They began to circle around, and they, and, and they went into different dances, hoping that that would really get them going. Now, for a while, Elijah remained quiet. And I think the, the neatest thing about this whole several chapters we're looking at, but especially in 1 Kings 18, is Elijah's response when they are getting no action from their God for fire, his response shows us that Elijah knew that God was going to give him the answer a little bit later. And so much so as he began to mock and taunt them. Ho, 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 your God can't do that, can he? Oh, ho, ho, and he's just going on and on and on. Which made them pray louder and harder and with more passion. And it says, starting in verse 27, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them, shout louder. He said, surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. He's making fun of their God, Baal. Maybe he's sleeping or, or, and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spear, which was their custom until their, their own blood flowed. Verse 29, midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response no one answered. No one paid attention because there was no God that they were worshiping. They did everything they could to get some sort of an answer and got nothing, not even a matchstick lit. They prayed all afternoon and still nothing, but Elijah poured it on. <laughs> That's the fun part of this. Will you read this? Elijah just kept pouring it on, asking them if their God was in deep meditation and could not hear them. Or maybe he was too busy talking to someone else. Or maybe he was on a journey. Or maybe even their God was in the bathroom. Where's your God? Is he in the bathroom? He doesn't hear you? These taunts addressed to the multitude of these priests in the hearing of the people whom he desired to dupe or to convince drove them into getting more and more excited and having more and more desire to see their dead God, no God, answer. But think about this for a minute. Elijah had such confidence that God would answer him that he taunted them even more. I've played a lot of different sports in my life. And if an if a individual is, is really cocky and they are better, they will taunt you that you're not going to do well. You might get on a golf course and they start taunting you. Hey, I'm going to beat you to death. I'm going to beat you to death. And, uh, well, that might be true. But you know what? You better do it after you say it. Elijah was saying it, but God hadn't yet done it. But he had confidence that God was going to do it. That's the neat thing. Now it's Elijah's turn. He told the, prof the, the false prophets to stand aside, and he would summon the people to gather around him. And he proceeded in the calmest and the most deliberate way. He wasn't going crazy like they were. He prepared the altar and even dug a trench around this altar. Then he does a crazy thing. He has the altar drenched with water time after time after time until the excess water filled the trench that was around the wood in the altar. And you can imagine what the people watching were thinking. What is he? He is crazy. Well, he's either had great faith or he was completely crazy. And the people thought he was crazy, but Elijah had great faith. If the false prophets praying could not get their God to even send a spark, how in the world did he think he alone could call fire down? It's just he's one guy. That's what the people were probably thinking. So here's Elijah standing in front of the altar and before the entire nation and hundreds of these false prophets. And, of course, King Ahab was there watching as well. To say Elijah needed a miracle is an understatement. If he failed, they would kill him for sure. 
and the Lord would be totally squeezed out of that nation. He was risking a lot, but he had confidence in a God who, who, who uh, gives a lot of miracles, lots of miracles. So Elijah did the only thing a man in desperation needs to do. He prays. He prays. Now, how big of a miracle did he need? Oh, I'd say it's a, a 10 on the, on the 1 to 10 scale myself. I'd say it's a 10. How big is God? Big enough. So Elijah offers one of the most effective prayers recorded in the Bible and asks God for a really big thing. We see this starting in verse 36. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. So God commanded him to pour that water on there and to have all that water in the, in the circle, in the trough. Verse 37, answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. He was not only setting up to see the miracle happen, but he wanted to change their hearts after they saw the miracle. And his prayer was simply two words, answer me, answer me. God did, didn't he? Even in our lives, we believe God will and does answer prayers today. Sometimes we feel that we need to really get emotional and really lift up our voices. And if you've ever been to a, a camp setting or a, an altar service and, 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 and people get excited and they think, I, I, need, to, I need to shout louder because if I shout louder, God's going to hear me. Well, I know that that's just kind of our makeup as, in, as uh, humans, but God hears us when we're not, when we, uh, you don't have to shout. God hears you. That's what was happening here. Elijah didn't get loud at all. He was calm and very somewhat quiet, but God answered. As we continue to unpack these verses, I'm amazed at the faith that Elijah had. While the other prophets are screaming and cutting themselves, Elijah goes into taunting them. That's the fun part of watching that, is he's taunting these guys. He had such confidence and faith that God was going to answer his prayer that he begins to start picking on him. He would have been maybe labeled a bully in our world. <laughs> oh, that we had that kind of confidence in God. When we, were, when we are sitting ready for God to do a miracle, we haven't seen the results yet, but we know that that's what we need, that we would have that kind of confidence that we could, we could taunt the devil because we know God's going to answer our prayer. Now, here's where it gets good. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. How many of you think he got a pretty good answer to his prayer? I mean, it, it burnt the stones. You, I, I don't know how that happens. That had to be hot. But he gets an answer to his prayer. And I wonder what it looked like to have that fire shoot down from heaven. What did that look like? And the only thing I can envision, it's like, you know, 4th of July, we saw a lot of things zoom, shoot up. Well, this was like zoom, shooting down onto this altar area. Kind of the reverse of some fireworks. I don't know. I wonder what it looked, what it looked like as these people of Israel and King Ahab sees what's going on. You know, they've been waiting all day for the fire to fall from these false prophets. And now Elijah prays a simple prayer and bam, the fire comes down and just does its thing. What was the look on their faces? Shock, horror, fear. It was certainly fear in all these false prophets because they knew that as a false prophet, they would be killed later. Because you, as, if you're a false prophet, you're killed in those days. It'd be so cool to watch that on a rerun. Maybe we can go to YouTube, and maybe it's there. Sean, would you pull that up on YouTube, please? It would have been an awesome to see the anger of King Ahab or the shock of King Ahab. I don't know what was on his face, because when God sent that fire down, it ruined his day. It ruined his life. Elijah's petition was powerful. The prophets of Baal prayed all day, and Baal didn't even make a spark, but Elijah pray, pray, prays a simple prayer, and instantly God sends the fire. Not only had God sent the fire down, but it was so intense. It burned up wet wood, 
saturated stones, the soil, and consumed all the water in the trench. That's a pretty good fire. That's just not, that's a massive fire. Verse 39 says, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Now, I like what that verse tells us. When all the people saw this, not some, but when all the people saw the miracle, they fell prostrate and they realized they had been worshiping a God that doesn't exist. And they had turned their hearts. They had repented at that moment and said, the Lord, he is God. What an incredible time that had to be. So how big is God? He's big enough to handle this. The spiritual direction of a nation was turned back to God in that one event. All because of one man was not afraid to confront the enemy and ask God for a miracle. Elijah believed God and the miracle was the result. And he prayed, answer me. And God did. Because of Elijah's faith, many people were steered back on course. Elijah asked for a victory producing miracle, and the enemy was crushed. So, this is the year 2020. What does that, what does this mean to us today? Elijah certainly had faith that, he, that when he prayed it was going to happen. He had no doubt at all that God was going to send fire down when he prays. Oh, that I would have that kind of faith. Oh, that I would have that kind of faith. Oh, that each of us would have that kind of faith. Before Elijah got to Mount Carmel, he had already witnessed God answering many prayers. I would say in this room, many of us, if not most of us, remember when God did this miracle in our lives or for somebody that we know and saw it. this miracle, this miracle, this miracle. I mean, I could go through a litany of things and I've told from time to time different things that I've seen God do incredible miracles in people's lives. I've seen that. But the best miracle isn't the ones he's done back there. It's the one that's in the future. Those are the miracles we need to concentrate on is the miracles that he's going to do in the future. Elijah had some times where he learned to trust God before this one huge event. Elijah was faithful to God's word. He heard it and he trusted in it. God spoke to him and it shows him that his trust is he is acting on what God had put in his heart. Today, I want to call on God to rain down from heaven fire upon us in a good way. We're not going to scorch any hair or any of that kind of stuff. Fire to stir Christians to be faithful to God. We need fire to keep away from sin in our lives. We need fire to let Christians surrender everything they have to Jesus. We need the fire of God to burn into men's souls to give them a desire to win the lost. And finally, we need fire in the souls of lost people to compel them to flee to the Lord and be saved. Our culture right now is nothing, and I'll say in a kind way, is nothing more than a compromising culture right now. People are compromising things that they have strongly held beliefs so that they can be accepted into the culture, and so people won't attack them. It's just, it, it's, it, it's crazy. We need the fire of God to give us the boldness to stand up and speak the truth. God send the fire of conviction from the Holy Spirit, let it consume us, let it empower us to do your will in our lives and in the lives of people around us. Would you just stand straight up with me for prayer? I guess that's the only way to stand, right? Straight up, but <laughs> I just didn't want you guys to break your social distancing thing is what I was trying to get at. Just bow your heads for a moment. You know, there's people that come here every week, and, and I, see, I see faces, I see bodies, I know you, many of you, but I can't see your heart. Only God can see your heart. We have some guests with us. We have people today that have been here for years. If you would say today, as your heads are bowed, and you say, you know what, Mark, I need to make a change in my life. 
I need to be more bold. I need to listen to God, and I need to be obedient to what he tells me to do, and I want to be obedient to what he tells me to do. Just lift your hand so I can pray for you up here. Okay, I'm not going to pull you out or anything. Okay, you want to be obedient to God. Man, I do. I do. Father, I pray right now for those that lifted their hands. Father, where we are, we are where we are compromising in our own lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be obedient to you and obey what your word says to us and obey what your spirit says to us via the word. And God, I pray for those that lifted their hands. Father, I pray that you would take us as a congregation as a church and help us to reach into this region in the Grand Island and the surrounding towns help us to reach into this region into people's lives who need to hear about you Lord I pray that in Jesus name amen amen now, Pastor Sean were you going to come forward I just can't are you tied down there pretty can you come can you come and close this what's that Oh, want me to close it? Okay. I can do that one. He's pinned down right now, yes. I'm trying to end all the videos and all that kind of stuff. And I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness in giving because we have upgraded a lot of different of the equipment back there. And if you've seen us on either Facebook or YouTube, the quality is much, much better. And the quality of the sound is going through the soundboard down through a machine and then now it's being loaded directly instead of just hitting from the air. And the quality of the picture is remarkable. You know, we're in, a, we're in a world now that being on the internet is everything with the church. You know, obviously you guys were gone for a while and but now you're back but there's still other people that are watching online. And so thank you for your faithfulness as we continue to step in and continue to march and you know, get better equipment. Now, I'm not going crazy, okay? So I'm not spending lots of money, but we are getting better equipment. We've got two-level platform. I got to build another platform. He needs to get a little higher back there. But I say thank you. Father, I just pray right now that you would be with us to this week. You would be with this congregation. Help us to develop and have the spirit of Elijah upon us that when we see something that is amiss and opposite of what you want, we would speak truth to people that need to hear it. And I pray, Father, that we would be able to speak into people's lives this week as never before. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed, and I know Pastor Chris is going to sing another song, though.
Deserve the glory. 